American Catholic History is brought to you by the StarQuest Production Network and is made possible by our many generous patrons. If you'd like to support the podcast, please visit sqpn.com slash give. Hello and welcome to American Catholic History, sponsored by Beatrix Media, providing writing, digital marketing, website strategy and construction, and search engine optimization services. Visit BeatrixMedia.com. Experience your world communicated. If you like American Catholic History, please help others find it by sharing this episode and giving us a five-star rating wherever you get your podcasts. I'm Noelle Heaster Crow. And I'm Tom Crow. Today we're talking about one of my favorite actresses, Betty Hutton. I love Betty Hutton films. She is so fun and full of life. No matter what part she played, she threw her whole self into it, bringing an energy and passion that just pulls you in. Yeah. Hutton was a Hollywood superstar in the 1940s and 50s, so right in your movie, classic movie wheelhouse. Yeah. She was known for her blonde hair and her huge energy. Yeah. Bob Hope once referred to her as a vitamin pill with legs. (laughs) Her energy was infectious, and her performances were completely from the heart. She, yeah, she's like a living embodiment of St. Augustine's line, Lord, thou hast made us for thyself, and our heart is restless until it rest in thee. In a lot of ways, yes, she was all heart, and she was perpetually looking for rest and peace. But despite tremendous success, she didn't find these until much later in life. Yeah, I mean, she was a Hollywood star, what everyone dreams of. But in her private life, she didn't really know peace or love for so long. And the beautiful story of how that intervention happened is entirely unexpected. It includes her living as the cook in a rectory for five years. Hollywood star to rectory cook. No one sees that coming, but the Lord does work in mysterious ways. Yes, yes, he does. (laughs) So let's begin Betty Hutton's story. Hutton was born Elizabeth June Thornburg on February 26, 1921. She was the second child, both daughters, born to Percy and Mabel Thornburg. When Elizabeth was just two years old, Percy abandoned the family for another woman. And that was the last they heard of him until a telegraph arrived in 1937 when she was 16 years old, informing them of his death by suicide. After he left, Mabel moved with the two girls to Detroit, where she made money doing laundry and sewing, but that wasn't all she did. This was Prohibition-era Detroit, and Mabel knew how to make beer. So she ran a speakeasy to make a few more dollars. Unfortunately, she also did this to provide for her own habit. Mabel struggled mightily with alcoholism. Yeah, and young Elizabeth's first experience of singing to affect an audience happened kind of because of this. When Elizabeth was just three years old, one of her mother's customers showed up drunk and angry. He threatened to attack Mabel with Elizabeth in the room. Elizabeth just burst into song to distract him. He left with no harm done. Many years later, Elizabeth said that that experience was her earliest clear memory of her childhood. Talk about childhood traumas. Your father leaves, your mother is an alcoholic, there's a stream of men who come around just to buy illegal alcohol, and you, at just three years old, have to break into song to prevent your mother from being attacked. It's a terrible early childhood, and one that, in many ways, explains the next 50 or so years of her life. Yeah, absolutely. A hallmark of a Betty Hutton performance is how raw and vulnerable she is, always wearing her heart on her sleeve. Later in life, when reflecting on her career, she said, I like to make people happy. It does something to my soul. And she had plenty of opportunity to learn the craft because when she was young, her mother recognized that she could earn money having Betty and her sister, Marion, sing. So she had them sing for her customers and she started taking them around Detroit to sing. After ninth grade, Betty didn't return to school. At 15, she was hired by the band leader at the nightclub, Vincent Lopez, to be the main singer for his band. He also gave her her stage name, Betty Hutton. Part of the deal was that she would be able to bring her mother and sister along with the band when they traveled. One of the great benefits of this arrangement was that her sister Marion was noticed by Glenn Miller, who then signed her sister to sing in his band. So now with her new name, Betty Hutton stayed with Lopez's band until 1940, when she moved to New York for a big break, a role on Broadway. And from there, her rise was meteoric. She was spotted on Broadway and within two years was invited to Hollywood by B.G. De Silva, who was an executive director at Paramount Studios. She was practically a star overnight. 
Her credits through the 1940s included The Fleet's Inn, Let's Face It, Here Come the Waves, The Miracle of Morgan's Creek, The Perils of Pauline, Somebody Loves Me, and Incendiary Blonde. The Incendiary Blonde actually became her nickname in Hollywood. And some of these films had songs that she came to be known for, like Murder, He Said, Doctor, Lawyer, Indian Chief, I Wish I Didn't Love You So, It Had to Be You, and many others. Between her up-tempo singing and her energetic performances, she was a favorite among G.I.s during World War II, including as a pinup girl right next to Betty Grable. Bob Hope, whose quip about her being a vitamin pill with legs came in the context of a World War II concert to support the war effort, also said of her, if they put a propeller on Hutton and sent her over Germany, the war would be over by Christmas. She was that popular and that beloved that quickly in the 1940s. But her biggest role came in 1950. Judy Garland herself, a superstar, was cast to play Annie Oakley in the MGM adaptation of Irving Berlin's smash Broadway hit, Annie Get Your Gun. But Garland wasn't into the role. Yeah, as Hutton put it, Garland was more of a sophisticated actress, and she was a bit older, and she played more genteel or high-class roles. As far as Hutton was concerned, the role of Annie Oakley was made for her. She once quipped about herself, Oh, I couldn't sing good, but boy, I sure sang loud. And since the role of Annie Oakley had been popularized on Broadway by Ethel Merman, Hutton was perfect for the screen version. So when Garland bowed out of the role, it was offered to Hutton, and she seized the opportunity. Yeah. Now, I actually got to go see Annie Get Your Gun on Broadway, not starring Ethel Merman. It was uh, Bernadette Peters. And I agree with Betty Hutton. She is perfect for the screen role. She has such high energy. She's rough around the edges, a bit spastic. Plus, she could pull off the backwoods girl shtick in a way that Judy Garland simply couldn't. She nailed the big songs. There's no business like show business. Anything you can do, I can do better. No, you can't. Oh, yes, I can. And you can't get a man with a gun. Nope. <laughs> anyway. Could try, though. <laughs> but the high of being in her dream show turned out to be a nightmare. The rest of the cast and the crew working on Annie Get Your Gun resented that she had taken Garland's place, and they treated her horribly. MGM didn't even invite her to opening night in New York. In many ways, this was the beginning of the end for Betty Hutton in Hollywood. But she soldiered on because she didn't know anything else. She still lived by making other people smile. In 1952, she was cast in the lead female role in Cecil B. DeMille's epic Academy Award-winning film, The Greatest Show on Earth. Again, this success should have been a tremendous high for her. And since she played a trapeze artist, that's kind of a pun. But anyway, <laughs> but, but, it turned, but it turned into a disaster. During filming, again, she was a trapeze artist. She hurt her arm badly since she did her own stunts, and she started taking painkillers. This turned into an addiction. At first, it was just painkillers, but it didn't take long for her to move on to whatever pills she could get her hands on. She only starred in a few more films in the 1950s before her self-destructive behavior caused the big opportunities to dry up entirely. Through the end of the 1950s and throughout the 1960s, she was in a downward spiral. She had one season on TV with The Betty Hutton Show, and in 1964, she temporarily filled in for Carol Burnett in a Broadway show while Burnett was hospitalized. There were a few guest star appearances, but she couldn't hang on to anything. Her personal life was also a mess. Four marriages came and went, with three daughters born along the way, but she still couldn't find herself or someone who really loved her. Later in life, she said that each of her four husbands was in love with Betty Hutton, but none of them truly knew or loved her. In 1967, she was forced to declare bankruptcy, and as if things couldn't get worse, her mother died horribly in a fire. This was basically the last straw for Hutton. She loved her mother dearly. Betty had vowed when she was a young girl that she would become a big star and help her mother to stop drinking. And now her mother was dead, and she had ruined her life. In her despair, she attempted suicide at least once. She was forced to move from one place to another as her money was gone and she was basically homeless. In 1969, the hotel where she had been living was compelled to kick her out, but they didn't just toss her on the street. Someone from the hotel took her to a minister who helped her to get cleaned up. She lived in his care for about five years. 
She regained some of her strength and her singing voice, so in 1974, she was able to take some gigs in a dinner theater in Framingham, Massachusetts, very close to my home, by the way. She was singing pieces there from Any Get Your Gun, but her hard lifestyle had taken its toll. One night on stage, she collapsed. Many thought she was on the verge of suffering the same fate as her old friend Judy Garland, who had died in similar self-destructive circumstances in 1971, just three years earlier. Hutton checked into a Boston rehab hospital. After she'd been there for a while and was on the point of giving up on rehab, she saw through her window a Catholic priest bringing a woman for care. Hutton noticed how attentive he was to the woman and how tenderly he cared for her. Hutton thought to herself, I'm going to meet that man. He's going to save my life. And she was correct. Hutton got to know the woman whom the priest had brought for treatment. Her name was Pearl, and she was the cook at his rectory. The priest's name was Peter McGuire, and he was pastor at St. Anthony Church in Portsmouth, Rhode Island. Pearl called him a saint who helps everyone. He came back to visit often, and Betty made a point to introduce herself. Father Peter didn't recognize her and apparently didn't even know who Betty Hutton was. He must not have been much of a moviegoer. But he recognized a lost sheep when he saw one. And during his visits back to the hospital, he would visit Betty and talk with her. Father McGuire learned her life story. He recognized that she'd never been able to leave behind the pain of her father leaving her at such a young age. In 2000, Betty Hutton sat for an interview with Robert Osborne of Turner Classic Movies. It was a very revealing and tender interview. If you ever have the chance to watch it, you really should. During it, Betty talked a lot about Father McGuire, and she said in part... I never found me until Father McGuire. I was the product, like hamburgers, hot dogs. Father said, Betty, you're just a hurt child. Let's start from the word go. And that's where they started. Betty left the treatment facility and moved to Rhode Island, where Father McGuire offered her work in his rectory. Eventually, she moved into the rectory as a live-in housekeeper and cook. And there she lived for five years, washing, ironing, cooking, sweeping, and cleaning. Later in life, she said she managed all of this by imagining she was playing in The Song of Bernadette, which is the story of St. Bernadette Subaru, the girl who experienced apparitions at Lourdes. Father McGuire helped her to stay clean. He also helped her to learn many of the subjects that she never learned since she had left school after ninth grade. And naturally, Father McGuire also introduced Hutton to Catholicism. She was eager to learn and took to the faith with energy because, well, she did everything with energy. But this was important. In the interview with Robert Osborne, she said, And that's how I became a Catholic. It was so great, because as I walked down the aisle and I know I'm going to receive Christ, I would sob so, because this brought something out of me I never knew was in there. That's my heart. Christ is my heart. But I didn't know him. I did not know God. Like you said at the beginning, her heart was restless until she found Christ to rest in. Absolutely. She'd been dealing for so many years with the pain of her father's abandonment and subsequent suicide, plus her beloved mother's addiction and then her tragic death. Here in the Catholic faith, through the care of Father McGuire, she finally found a home, a place to rest. She found people who cared for her, and she found the deep spiritual wholeness she'd been looking for her whole life. After a time, Betty was able to get back into singing and acting. In September of 1980, she played Miss Hannigan for a two-week run in a Broadway production of Annie. One tremendous highlight for her was that her daughters and grandchildren came to see her in this role. Her daughters had cut off contact seven years earlier, and she'd never met her grandchildren. She also was well enough in 1983 to be the special guest star of an episode of Jukebox Saturday Night. In this show, she performs a number of songs, and she talks a bit about her life. I actually watched it while writing this script for this episode, and I tell you, everything about Betty Hutton is there. She's spunky, she's bubbly, she's energetic, and she's also very vulnerable and raw and, and honest, and tears flow. And she was 62. I know! I hope I have that much energy and that big of a voice when I'm 62. Yes, well, as she said, she definitely sang loud, if not good, but I think she's saying pretty oh, good yeah. also. We'll share the link to this half hour show in our show notes. I encourage folks to take a look. You'll really enjoy it. She talks about Father McGuire, and he's in the audience, so you get to see him too. And if you notice, for most of the show, at least one of her hands is closed even as she's gesturing, and she gestures a lot. And that's because she's actually clutching a rosary given to her by Father McGuire. 
The strands of beads were a constant for her. In that Robert Osborne interview, she's holding them the entire time also. She says to Osborne in that interview, I don't move anywhere without the rosary because I'm scared inside. I'm never secure. But she found support and security in her Catholic faith. In another interview, she said, nothing has brought me true happiness until I discovered Catholicism. But getting back into performing wasn't all she was doing in the early 80s. In 1982, with Father McGuire's support, she enrolled at Salve Regina College in Newport, Rhode Island. Salve Regina considered her lived experience to be equivalent to a bachelor's degree, so she entered right into the master's program in psychology, which she completed graduating cum laude in 1986. On graduation day, a beaming but nervous Hutton received her diploma to raucous applause from everyone present. She blew a kiss to the assemblage and lifted the diploma heavenward in thanksgiving, all the while she was clutching her rosary. After graduating, she taught drama and comedy at Salve Regina and at Boston's Emerson College. She said this was a neat job because then I could begin to give Betty to them, not just the commodity, the hot dog. In 1996, one last tragedy befell Betty Hutton when Father McGuire died. But his death, painful as it was, did not send her into another tailspin, since she now had her faith in Christ to support her. She did, however, leave Rhode Island. She moved to Palm Springs, California in 1997. It was during this period that she did the interview with Robert Osborne, which aired in 2000. But apart from a few appearances like this, she lived the last decade of her life in peace and relative obscurity. In 2007, after a battle with colon cancer, she died peacefully at her home. Betty Hutton, the incendiary blonde with the huge voice, huge energy, and huge heart, in the end found peace and rest in Christ. You've been listening to American Catholic History, sponsored by Beatrix Media on the StarQuest Production Network. If you've been enjoying our podcast, please help others find it by sharing this episode and by giving us a five-star rating and a good review. Be sure to check out our sponsor, Beatrix Media, providing writing, digital marketing, website strategy and construction, and search engine optimization services. Visit BeatrixMedia.com. Experience your world communicated. Also, please support the many fine productions of SQPN at sqpn.com slash give. To learn more about Betty Hutton, to find previous episodes, or to learn about our upcoming pilgrimages to important and unforgettable Catholic holy sites, please visit AmericanCatholicHistory.org. We also love feedback and hearing about great Catholic history sites and stories from all over. You can email us at history at sqpn.com or find us on Facebook at facebook.com slash American Catholic History, on Instagram at ACH underscore podcast, or follow StarQuest on Twitter at SQPN. I'm Noelle Hester Crow. And I'm Tom Crow. Thank you once again for joining us on American Catholic History, sponsored by Beatrix Media and produced by StarQuest. <laughs>